Right. Hello. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome back to part two. Um, my name is Richard Parrish. I'm a professor of sports law at Edge Hill University in the United Kingdom. Uh, for those of you wondering where Edge Hill University is, it's one of the one of the universities that doesn't have a, a name, place name in its title. It's um, just uh, outside Liverpool in the northwest of England. Um, I have the uh, great uh, privilege of chairing this meeting today with our very fine speakers. Um, uh, a while ago, in, in fact, with Thierry, I was a member of the European Commission's high level group on sport diplomacy. Um, and so this, and I'm very pleased to be part of this TESD project as well, looking at the development of the European Union's uh, sport diplomacy strategy. And uh, we had some really interesting uh, uh, discussion in the, in the first panel regarding the tra trajectory of the European Union's approach. However, um, uh, we have some speakers who are far more knowledgeable than I about this. Let me just uh, highlight that we've had a, a, a last minute substitution. Um, we were due to hear from uh, Carmen Perez Gonzalez, who was also a member of the European Commission's high level group on sport diplomacy. Carmen, unfortunately, has had to return uh, home to Madrid to attend to a family incident. So uh, we wish Carmen and her family all the very best. Um, but I'm delighted that uh, Thierry uh, Zintz has agreed to step in, uh, who have of course, is a very able replacement, uh, given that he was also a member of the European Commission's high-level group. Um, so what I'm planning on doing is um, I'm, I, I'm not going to in introduce fully the, uh, the, the, the speakers, but we have uh, Olivier, Thomas, Raffaella, and Thierry. I'm just going to uh, ask them very briefly just to introduce themselves um, and just uh, explain what their connection is with the uh, the issue of sport diplomacy before we then go on and, and have a, a discussion. So maybe, uh, Olivia, do you want to explain who you are? Hello, uh, good afternoon. My name is um, Olivier de France. I'm, I'm afraid I'm in a bit of a schizophrenic situation because I currently based in the UK um, <clears throat> and uh, I prepared my presentation in English. So I do hope you will not take this as a slight against uh, francophonie. Uh, it's by no means an offense. Uh, it's just simply that's how I prepared the presentation. Um, I work uh, partly here at IRIS as well on uh, Europe as a political and geopolitical actor. Looking forward to the discussion. Thanks so much. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Thomas Dahl. I'm in sports manager and tour director from the Danish Sport for All Association, DGI, where I manage the national Danish performance team. And I have done so for 15 plus years, working with international relations and, and partnerships. So that's my reason for being here today. Ciao, I am Raffaella. I work for the Italian Union Sport for All. So it's about um, 13 years I'm working with uh, WISP and um, I work in international projects and uh, especially in um, trying to promote what we call the grass sport diplomacy. That's my experience. Good afternoon, everyone. I was intended to speak in English, but uh, I was asked today to speak French. Je vais donc parler français, qui est ma langue maternelle d'ailleurs. Je suis professeur à l'Université de Louvain en Belgique, dans le domaine du management du sport. J'ai été pendant 16 ans le vice-président du comité olympique belge et je préside aujourd'hui Special Olympics Belgium, autrement dit le sport pour les personnes intellectuellement moins valides. Et euh, ben voilà, man, également membre de la commission de l'éducation du CIO et de l'Agence mondiale antidopage. Okay, so how things are going to run, um, we're going to address two broad themes, essentially. Um, Olivier and Thierry are going to discuss the more sort of conceptual dimension to sport diplomacy, 
um, and ask about uh, the role of the European Union as a foreign policy actor and the position that sport can play in terms of amplifying uh, core EU diplomatic messages. Um, and then we're going to have a more practical discussion because uh, Rafaela and Thomas were, are both part of this project um, leading uh, some pilot projects within it. And so we're going to have a discussion uh, about those. And we're gonna have a, a mixed approach where we're gonna have uh, presentations, Q and A, video. So uh, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll retain your interest for uh, another hour. I'm first going to hand over to uh, Olivier. And um, I, I asked Olivier to, to reflect upon um, something that the Belgian foreign minister once said uh, a number of years ago, which was that uh, the European Union is an economic giant, but a political dwarf. And I was just wondering, given the passage of time, the extent to which that can still hold true today, whether or not it's relevant, and who's it relevant to, that the EU is a diplomatic actor, um, and what role sport can play within that foreign policy toolkit. And if the EU is interested in developing a sport diplomacy strategy, something that I'm going to talk to Thierry in more detail about, what are the attendant risks? Are there any attendant risks? Or is this very much a win-win given the popularity of sport? But maybe there are some risks. Now, Olivia, I believe you're going to, uh, you've got a presentation. So um, when you're ready, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, thank you, wonderful. Um, <clears throat> actually, reflecting on that quote, I think the original quote um, by the Belgian Foreign Affairs Minister, uh, which was before the Gulf War, I think it was 1990, was um, actually ended by saying that the uh, EU is a political dwarf and a uh, military worm, un ver de terre militaire, un nain politique et un ver de terre militaire. Um, so the question is, does that still hold up, hold up today? Um, We've had a few episodes, um, thankfully, since the uh, Gulf War. So the EU has actually tried to develop as a diplomatic actor. I don't know how much you know uh, about this, so I'll just give you just a very basic, uh, just a very basic numbers. Um, these are very well known. Uh, they're usually numbers that, um, in EU capitals or in Brussels, uh, politicians tend to trot out. Uh, just to show that there is a high level of support for European foreign policy, for the EU as a diplomatic actor. Uh, and that basically this support, remarkably, that actually goes back all the way to the date of the quote by our foreign minister. It goes back to 1992. Um, these are just the, uh, it's the data from the uh, Eurobarometers. What's remarkable is how enduring it actually is um, before and after the enlargements. So the idea is this percentage is very high, but it's also very enduring across time, right? Uh, of course, what well, politicians uh, tend to, you know, slightly um, skid over is the fact that that doesn't actually mean we have a common definition of what a European foreign policy is, as ever with most of these concepts in the EU, you often, uh, you may have heard about the concept of strategic autonomy as well. Uh, some of these concepts basically have as many definitions as you have countries, and some of them have as many definitions as you have Europeans. Um, so being in Paris, being in France, we have a definition of the, you know, the EU as a diplomatic actor, which is very much geared towards l'Europe puissance. Um, and from there stems l'Europe de la Défense, which is a very integrated way of thinking about European uh, security and foreign policy. Of course, outside of France, um, there's a variety of different views which do not always gel with l'Europe uh, puissance, particularly with regard to our cooperation with our allies, in particular the United States. The other caveat is that what politicians don't usually show is the... Um, the, the second bit, which is that um, actually 
if you're looking purely at the EU as a diplomatic actor, you get high levels of support. If you then look into the Eurobarometers, actually for the hierarchy of concerns, of preoccupations within, um, within the EU about these issues, um, it turns out that the level of support for EU foreign policy is a common EU foreign policy is high. However, um, it's quite low on the list of priorities for Europeans. So as you can, this is basically just from, um, for young people, but it would be, because I, I want to focus a bit on young people because we're talking about sport, but it would be kind of the same for Europeans uh, as a whole. So basically, before you get to ensuring the kind of EU security, defense, and foreign policy, basically, you go through um, uh, protecting the environment, uh, climate change, education, poverty, employment, human rights, and only then you get to EU security and um, and defense. So there's a double whammy there. It's first of all, uh, when when you do actually ask people, they they're in support, but you're not quite sure what they're in support of because people have different views on this, and um, Actually, when you look at the broader uh, different preoccupations, it tends to be quite low. Now, you'll notice these are numbers that came before the, U the Russian war in the Ukraine. We don't have the numbers since the war. And it would be very interesting to see whether that has shifted, particularly amongst young people who, as we know, grew up with perhaps the illusion that we would never have a war again on the European um, continent. I, I do think this is interesting, though, because it kind of shows that um, uh, the fact that kind of this the, the geopolitics is so low usually in this scale um, is a bit of an issue because if, uh, for those of you who, who, who study geopolitics you'll know that if you're not interested in geopolitics then inevitably geopolitics will be interested in you um, in other words um, you know it's something that the EU unfortunately and Europe as a whole as it's, it's been a hard lesson that we've had to learn. And I think Russia's war in Ukraine shows again that we haven't really necessarily learned that lesson. So it's really important to find ways of talking about geopolitics because it's very complicated. Um, and I think in, it, it's also very top down. It's already sort of from the EU capitals outwards. So it's very difficult to talk to people um, uh, from the institutions uh, about geopolitics. And I think for in order to do that, you need to talk about stuff that actually matters to people that affects their everyday lives. So obviously, for example, the soy plants that feed our animals, the microchips that make this laptop run, the lithium that make our batteries uh, go, the oil, gas, um, and coal that make our, our, our networks and our cars actually run, but also sports. I think uh, it's been mentioned here before, um, the way uh, sports reacted to the Russian war in the Ukraine in a, such a proactive way is a very good example of this, of the link, of the intimate link between geopolitics and sports. And I think sport is a very, very promising entry point for understanding and explaining uh, diplomacy, geopolitics and the EU's role in that. And we're obviously lucky to have here some of the sort of people to have done this for the first time consistently in France, uh, Carole, of course, and our colleague uh, Pascal Boniface were two pioneers in France in this matter. It's been mentioned, and I, I'm delighted to be uh, here to partake in some of these efforts today. Um, my second point is that I suppose I, I haven't been part of this uh, project from from uh, over over the duration of it, so I can afford maybe to be a I'll be a bit tangential, perhaps a bit kind of constructively um, critical. I I do understand uh, I, over the course of the first panel, I do understand that sport has to have an institutional perspective. I do understand there's an interest for France of having a, a position itself uh, within sports diplomacy, and I understand there is an interest for the EU of doing so. But I also want to argue that sport is not just a means to an end. It's not just um, something we can use for institutional diplomacy. It, we can also study it as an end in itself, not just as a means to a, a different end. It's an object of study in itself. And when you do so, you realize how awfully interesting and actually how awfully uh, understudied it actually is. I, I think sport and football in particular as as the most popular sport on the planet is a real kind of 
laboratory of all the political tensions that are rife in the world today, of identity. It's a cross-section um, of all that. Uh, unfortunately, I, I think it's slightly sort of, um, um, I suppose in, I suppose in political terms, it's, it's underestimated as a political object. It's undervalued as a cultural object. And I think it's understudied as a research object. And I think this is unfortunate, and I'll give you a few examples of why. Uh, one of my favorite anecdotes was during the Brexit debate. Um, the Cardiff City, who's a football club in Wales, had a coach called Neil Warnock, who was a Brexiteer. And during a press conference, he said uh, to one of the journalists, to hell with the rest of the world. That was, that's the quote, to hell with the rest of the world. Um, this is particularly ironic, seeing as Cardiff City actually belongs to an owner who is from Malaysia, and that the president, the chairman of uh, Cardiff City, still today, is a businessman who comes from Turkey and Cyprus. Um, look at Manchester City as well. It's been mentioned. It's a huge club. It's a huge brand. It's someone who can. It's a club who can bring in like huge footballers like Erling ha like Erling Haaland. Sorry, you can get the best of international talent. At the same time, it's coached by someone who supports Catalonian independence very staunchly. And it's supported by um, a lot of the working class of Manchester and the wider region, including uh, the famous uh, Gallagher brothers, which you can see here, in a, in, a, in a city that actually voted to remain in the UK at 60.4%. 60, Whereas the whole Manchester region outside of, uh, outside of Manchester uh, basically voted for leave. You can see this kaleidoscope of kind of political, um, of political frictions and how, as Simon was saying in the first panel, how interesting, how, how complex it actually is. Um, this is also, I suppose, partly the case here in Paris for PSG. It's a club, I, I, was, a, I was a season ticket holder before the Qatari owners came. They wanted to build a global brand, which brought the club to, you know, um, have, you know, these massive, massive players. But in a way, for 10 years, they kind of um, pulled out the roots of the club, the route that links the club to the city and to the people who live in the city, right? Uh, and it's difficult as a supporter to support a brand. You support a link to, to the club, to the players, but you can't really support a brand. And it's interesting that now the owners are kind of rowing back on this and trying to inject some more French and Parisian identity into the club. Uh, last example is um, is Liverpool. I show you I, I showed you the the banner that's at Anfield um, behind the behind the goal. It's a very famous one. Um, you know, instead of Marx, Engels, and Lenin, it features Klopp, Shankly, and Bob Paisley. Um, it's because there's a very very strong link uh, in Liverpool between the club and the history of the docks. Uh, between the club and the memory of the Hillsborough uh, catastrophe, between the club and its working class identity, and its rejection of the right wing newspaper, uh, The Sun, which is still actually perpetuated today by its coach. On the other hand, it is also famously a club that has basically tried to trademark or copyright one or the other, I can't remember, the name Liverpool, to appropriate the name Liverpool for the club in order that it can use it as a brand, as a corporate as a corporate brand across the world. Um, it's a club that's tried to expropriate the, uh, its fans who lived in the houses at, uh, in the, on the outskirts of, this, of, Anfield, of, of, An of Anfield Road. Um, it's coached by a German personality who was hostile to Brexit. It's um, owned by an, an American, for the moment, an, an American owner, um, and it has all manner of uh, like very strong Muslim players like Mohamed Salah, for example, that are very much celebrated in Liverpool. So there again, there is so much to understand there in that, in that kaleidoscope of things of a club like Liverpool who actually, in a way, uses its working class identity and its local, an its local anchor as a corporate selling point to build a global brand. So it's using its working class route as a corporate selling point. And that is, that is something that, you know, it's just absolutely fascinating. Um, basically, I think the underlying issue here is 
uh, I, I will clo I'll, I'll quote Jonathan Wilson, who's a journalist for The Guardian in the UK. He said, basically, the, the underlying question here is, can you get all the benefits of globalization without uh, the drawbacks? Can you be cosmopolitan without destroying communities? And he says that looks very much like the key cultural question of our time. And I think it's also the key underlying question for the European Union. Um, so sport is also some is a, is a laboratory I, I think that would it would very much be um you know useful to, to to have a look at just because um it's just so interesting and and i'm not saying it's it's totally not studied i'm saying as I was saying in the in the first panel it's still slightly understudied perhaps because of social uh, and cultural biases um i'll just double check the time Okay, I'll just make. I'll give you one last example, and I'll I'll stop uh, just because Simon mentioned uh, Richelieu and the first presentation. So I wanted to I wanted to to mention uh, Louis the Ninth, who you, you can see up there. Um, um, I, I I thought of this because I I once um, I I. I love looking uh, in the sports football forums at the commentaries. I think they're fascinating. And uh, I once realized looking through the commentaries at the users' names, and they all had uh, X, Y, and Z from X, Y, and Z. So for example, um, there would be like Richie 59500 as a kind of French postcode, or um, Le Milanista 19, or uh, basically you, ha you would have your name with your postcode as an identification of where you where you come from so these tensions between the local anchor and the broader political issues are actually something that are very contemporary but i think also uh, very enduring very lasting louis the ninth who when he actually signed his correspondence signed it louis de poissy uh, just as you know someone on a forum a football forum today will say i am louis from paris or i am louis from bourgogne or something uh, why he did this at the time? Because France um, was still consolidating. It was still a very, um, um, it was a nation that hadn't yet quite consolidated. And so in order to basically show that he came, he had a kind of local origin, he would say, he would sign his correspondence, Louis de Poissy. And this would substantiate his claim to be king of France. Uh, and I think in the same way, football is a sort of way for people today it may be undervalued culturally and socially, but it's it's one of the ways in which people are still attached for non-economic reasons to a given territory and to a given political identity. So essentially, all I'm saying is, I, I know I'm slightly sort of probably preaching to the choir here, because that old joke about researchers saying that you should just research this more. But I do think it's important to study football, to, to study sports, not only as a kind of means to an institutional end, but as not as an institutional opportunity or as a means for sports diplomacy, but also as a very powerful grassroots um, phenomenon. Thank you very much. I'll keep the last point for later. Thank you. Very interesting. I, that, that, uh, I, I'm a, a Leeds United fan living in the Liverpool area, and it's been a tough few years until our new American uh, manager, and we finally managed to beat them at Anfield. And I was delighted that I was at that match. Um, so um, I'm going to turn to, to Thierry now. So foreign policy clearly isn't the sexiest subject on the public's radar at the moment, but sport is. So is that the kind of the reason why the European Union is showing an interest in this area, in sport diplomacy specifically? Mais je dirais pour répondre à, à cette question-là, j'ai envie de faire une une petite marche arrière pour démarrer. Vous connaissez tous ce quote de Nelson Mandela qui dit « Sport has the power to speak to people ». Alors, je pense que ce, cette citation, elle est intéressante parce qu'elle met en perspective la notion de « power » et de « soft power ». Et quand on essaie de, de décrypter un petit peu la notion de « power » et certainement dans le contexte de la diplomatie, eh bien, on voit dans le port la capacité d'adresser, d'analyser, de résoudre des problèmes, la capacité de porter une certaine puissance pour obtenir certains résultats. Mais le mot « soft » nous amène à autre chose. 
tout d'abord par, euh, par les moyens que le mot « soft » suppose. Quand on parle de « soft » diplomatie, on fait souvent référence à l'éducation, à la culture, au sport. Mais en même temps, quand on parle de « soft » diplomatie, on doit aussi se poser la question des acteurs qui sont impliqués. Quand on parle de « soft » diplomatie ou de « diplomatie douce » par le sport, eh bien, on va se rendre compte que, bien sûr, il y a des acteurs gouvernementaux, mais il y a également nombre d'acteurs non gouvernementaux, qu'il s'agisse d'acteurs non gouvernementaux de type sportif, voire d'acteurs non gouvernementaux de type non sportif qui vont utiliser le sport pour permettre à leurs actions de se développer. Et on pourrait penser à des organisations comme la Croix-Rouge, Médecins sans frontières, et ainsi de suite. Alors, pour répondre à la, à la question que Richard posait, je pense que oui, effectivement, s'il si y a un intérêt de l'Union européenne par rapport à la question de la diplomatie par le sport, c'est aussi parce que l'Union européenne a un certain nombre de forces qui vont se mettre en regard d'un certain nombre de faiblesses. Et je voudrais brièvement prendre les forces et puis adresser les faiblesses ou les risques, en tout cas, comme le suggérait Richard. En, en termes de force, mais ne perdons pas de vue que l'Europe, l'Union européenne dans ce cas-ci, se caractérise par un héritage sportif extrêmement important. Ne perdez pas de vue, si vous avez fait un petit peu d'histoire du sport, que finalement, les modalités du sport moderne qui se dit universel, c'est d'abord des modalités, d'abord britanniques et puis européennes du sport, qu'on a essayé d'imposer à l'ensemble de la planète. Je dis toujours en riant que si on fait du judo aux Jeux olympiques, c'est parce qu'on a eu les Jeux olympiques de Tokyo, mais j'attends encore le jour où on aura la lutte gabonaise au programme des Jeux olympiques. La question mérite d'être posée. Donc, il y a ce, cet héritage sportif au niveau de l'Europe. Je pense qu'il y a aussi le fait, et le premier panel tout à l'heure l'a très, très bien montré avec l'exemple de la France, qu'un certain nombre de pays, et pas uniquement la France, hein, on peut citer l'Espagne, on peut citer la Croatie également, développent aujourd'hui des modalités de diplomatie par le sport au niveau de leur ministère des Affaires étrangères. Et enfin, je pense que par un ensemble de compétences que l'Union européenne a, elle peut se permettre d'utiliser le sport, notamment pour influencer les pays tiers avec lesquels elle entretient des relations ou pour développer les relations avec les pays candidats à l'adhésion à l'Union européenne. On a mentionné tout à l'heure les budgets du programme Erasmus, des budgets qui ont cru de façon importante et qui donnent une place au sport de plus en plus importante. Et quand on se met de l'autre côté, du côté des challenges, du côté des risques, du côté des faiblesses, eh bien, et on l'a évoqué tout à l'heure, et je pense que M. l'ambassadeur honoraire l'a mentionné tout à l'heure, il y a évidemment les relations avec les organisations sportives internationales qui sont challengeantes parce que les organisations sportives internationales revendiquent leur sacrée autonomie aussi longtemps que ça leur convient. Parce qu'il y a aussi la difficulté, et on le voit notamment dans le contexte de la guerre en Ukraine, à parler d'une seule voix au niveau européen. À certains moments, les intérêts nationaux prennent le pas sur les intérêts collectifs et il y a une divergence à émettre un message qui soit cohérent, qui soit consistant et qui soit porté par l'ensemble des acteurs de l'Union européenne. Et finalement, peut-être, et ça a aussi été mentionné dans le premier panel, à développer ce que j'appellerais une culture organisationnelle de la diplomatie par le sport. Cette culture n'existe pas réellement, ou pas encore, à l'échelle de l'Union européenne. Voilà, Richard. Thank you, Terry. Um, we were both part of the um, high-level group for Commissioner Navratic. Um, that, that group was formed in 2015, and we reported in 2016 with a, a report. Can you just reflect upon your time in that um, high-level group? And can you, what progress do you think has been made since then in terms of the European Union developing a strategy and how how do the conclusions of our project the TESD project do you think take that agenda forward 
Et donc, je vais, pour répondre à ta question, je vais me, me, me calquer sur ta demande. Hein. Donc, l'expérience et puis ce qui s'est développé depuis 2015-2016. Donc, ce, ce groupe de haut niveau sur la diplomatie par le sport a été mis en place par le commissaire Navrasic en 2015. Et il est intéressant de savoir comment se constitue un groupe de haut niveau au sein de l'Union européenne. À ce niveau-là, les commissaires ont le privilège, et c'est vraiment le privilège du prince, de constituer des groupes d'experts de haut niveau sur base de leur propre choix. Et ça, je pense que c'est important, ce sont des choix des commissaires. Alors, bien sûr, il y a des cabinets derrière, bien sûr, il y a des conseillers derrière, mais c'est comme ça, au départ, que les choses se mettent en place. Alors, ben, comme Richard et comme d'autres personnes dans cette salle, j'ai eu l'occasion de rejoindre ce groupe en 2015 et j'ai surtout eu le privilège d'en être le rapporteur et d'en être le rapporteur avec l'ancienne ministre des Sports française, Valérie Fourneron. Alors, je voudrais vous dire d'abord qu'à titre personnel, ça a été une expérience exceptionnelle parce que de faire ce rapport à deux, c'était la possibilité de mettre en présence une personne qui avait une expérience politique importante, Valérie Fourneron, et quelqu'un qui avait une certaine expérience de le monde du sport international. Et le fait de pouvoir travailler ensemble a été un enrichissement mutuel. Alors, vous allez me dire que ça, c'est ma petite popote interne et que ça ne vous concerne pas tellement, mais je pense que le rapport porte bien ces deux dimensions qui ont été portées par les membres et puis qui ont été portées par Valérie et moi-même, de pouvoir en faire quelque chose qui soit à la fois la synthèse d'une approche politique et d'une approche sportive. Et je pense que cet élément est important. Alors, ce qui s'est passé depuis 2015-2016, eh bien, il y a eu un certain nombre de choses. Alors, on pourra toujours dire que ce n'est pas assez, mais, Monsieur l'ambassadeur, je voudrais reprendre vos termes, en disant qu'il y a beaucoup de choses qui se sont passées. Et donc, peut-être pour les mettre en perspective, distinguer trois niveaux. Le niveau du Conseil de l'Union européenne, le niveau de la Commission et le niveau du Parlement, parce que vraiment, aux trois niveaux, il y a eu des actions que j'appellerais fort heureusement concomitantes, convergentes, allant dans, un, dans la même direction. Donc, très rapidement, après le dépôt du rapport du groupe de haut niveau sur la diplomatie sportive, dès 2016, le, concile de, le, le Conseil de l'Union européenne va adopter un certain nombre de conclusions relatives à la diplomatie par le sport ou à la diplomatie sportive, il y a une question sémantique là qu'on pourrait débattre un autre jour. En 2018, il y aura un document, des conclusions également, qui viendront de la part du Conseil européen et qui s'intitule en anglais « Promoting the common values of the EU through sport ». Donc, considérez, et c'est important, que nous avons un certain nombre de valeurs communes au sein de l'Union européenne que nous sommes susceptibles de promouvoir en utilisant le sport, ce qui est une action diplomatique en soi. Je vous passe un certain nombre d'étapes, mais un, un, un milestone important également, c'est 2021, avec la présidence portugaise de l'Union européenne. Alors, on vient de vivre cette longue période de Covid, mais ce fut l'occasion d'un tout premier déplacement parce que cette présidence s'est réunie en partie physiquement à Lisbonne, D'abord, pour un travail de débat entre les membres du Conseil de l'Union européenne sur une politique de la diplomatie sportive, suivie par une conférence de deux jours. Et je voudrais vous rappeler, pour terminer sur la dimension Conseil de l'Europe, que dans le EU Work Plan, le plan de travail de l'Union européenne pour les années 2021-2024, la diplomatie par le sport ou la diplomatie du sport apparaît comme un thème clé. Donc déjà du côté du Conseil, vous voyez qu'il y a un certain nombre d'éléments. Au niveau de la Commission, c'est une série d'événements qui se sont déroulés en 2016 et en 2017. Et en 2017-2018, on a eu un, deux événements majeurs dans les relations entre l'Union européenne et la Chine et dans les relations Union européenne-Japon, à savoir des accords de coopération avec ces deux pays dans lesquels la dimension de la diplomatie sportive était incluse et un certain nombre des membres du High Level Group on Sports Diplomacy ont eu l'occasion d'aller à Shanghai avec le commissaire européen et de mettre en place un certain nombre de relations avec 
les autorités sportives et civiles chinoises. Depuis lors, il y a un dialogue structurel qui s'est développé avec le mouvement sportif et qui inclut la dimension de la diplomatie sportive. Et enfin, les recommandations du High Level Group on Sports Diplomacy, mais d'un autre High Level Group qui avait été développé parallèlement et qui était intitulé High Level Group on Grassroots Sports Diplomacy, ces recommandations ont fait l'objet de toute une série de projets Erasmus et le projet TSD en est un exemple. Et enfin, au niveau du Parlement, pour être très, très bref, en 2021, le Parlement, lui, prend un petit peu le contre-pied de tout ça. Et le Parlement, en 2021, dit, eh bien, il y a un fameux manque d'intégration en matière sportive au niveau européen. Et il y a là un énorme travail à faire qui pourrait être pris en charge par le concept de diplomatie sportive européenne. Et le Parlement européen, à ce moment-là, cite les droits humains, la corruption, la mobilité des athlètes entre pays, cross-border mobility, comme on dit en anglais, la double carrière des sportifs, c'est-à-dire la carrière après la carrière, on n'est pas pensionné à 30 ans, d'accord, et le réseau des ambassadeurs du sport européen, qui, il faut bien le reconnaître, est encore embryonnaire, même si la France, au cours des dix dernières années, a eu une position pilote dans ce sens. Voilà, Richard. OK, thank you. And um, just, just one final question, Thierry, building on that. In terms of this project, the TESD project, um, I mean, you, you won't be able to go through all the, the recommendations, but what, what do you think is the, the, the chief recommendation that you'd like to see progressed, or, or the top two or the top three recommendations um, that you'd like to see implemented at the EU level? Well, first of all, uh, pardon, <laughs> tout d'abord, uh, le projet TSD, Towards a European Sports Diplomacy, Towards est important, hein? aboutir à, le projet TSD a en fait défini quatre grands champs de recommandations. Le premier champ est un champ dédié à des objectifs stratégiques pour la diplomatie sportive européenne. Le deuxième champ est dédié au concept de gouvernance d'une stratégie européenne de la diplomatie sportive. Le troisième champ est dédié à l'impact que cela pourrait avoir. Et le quatrième champ est dédié au futur de la diplomatie sportive européenne. Alors, comme me l'a demandé Richard, je ne vais pas énumérer tous les éléments qu'on a été positionnés dans chacun de ces quatre blocs, sinon ça nous prendrait trop de temps. Je m'en tiendrai à un, voire deux par bloc. Au niveau des objectifs stratégiques, eh bien, très clairement, la nécessité de connecter davantage les autorités publiques européennes et les organisations non gouvernementales et les organisations non gouvernementales sportives en charge de démarches de diplomatie sportive européenne et l'inclusion du concept de diplomatie sportive dans le champ plus large de la diplomatie. Au niveau de la gouvernance de la diplomatie sportive, eh bien, et on l'a encore entendu notamment durant le break tout à l'heure, la nécessité de renforcer la connaissance du concept de diplomatie sportive. Elle est faible, cette connaissance. Et quand vous, quand vous interrogez des gens d'ailleurs sur le concept plus large de diplomatie, beaucoup de gens sont en difficulté pour vous répondre. Donc, il y a un manque de connaissance du concept à ce niveau-là. Et dans cet esprit-là, en termes de gouvernance toujours, une des démarches proposées était de mettre en place un groupe d'experts dans le domaine qui pourrait notamment soutenir les démarches de plusieurs commissaires européens et notamment le, le haut représentant pour les affaires étrangères dans le contexte de la diplomatie sportive. Au niveau des impacts, j'en prends deux également. Eh bien, tout d'abord, euh, mettre en place une communication effective et qui transcende les cultures. Je ne sais plus quel intervenant dans la première partie euh, de, de l'exposé tout à l'heure, où c'était une question qui a été posée par la salle, a soutenu l'idée que 
la culture du nord de l'Europe n'est pas la culture du sud de l'Europe, que la culture de l'est de l'Europe n'est pas la culture de l'ouest de l'Europe. Et donc, il y a un vrai travail à faire de, de cross-cultural approach pour arriver à des choses consistantes. Et enfin, et ça va dans le même sens, renforcer les relations avec les pays tiers et la compréhension mutuelle de ce que l'on entend par la diplomatie sportive. Et puis, bien évidemment, pour le futur, eh bien, euh, je pense qu'il y a toute une série de challenges qui doivent être pris en compte, qui doivent être intégrés dans cette, dans cette réflexion, parce que le sport touche au climat. Je ne vais pas vous faire un petit dessin. Il y a quelques matchs de football qui se déroulent pour le moment. Le sport touche au « gender equity », le sport touche plus globalement à la gouvernance et donc dans ce contexte-là, il y a là aussi un certain nombre de recommandations qui sont mises en évidence. Mais Je vous invite à consulter le rapport final quand il sera publié où vous aurez le détail des recommandations. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Thierry. So, uh, I mean, EU sport diplomacy may be a, a, um, a new concept, um, but um, soft power, soft diplomacy, people-to-people -people diplomacy is not so new. I mean, we've heard already that one of, the, um, one of the competences that sits alongside sport in the European Treaty is uh, education. And we've heard about Erasmus and how Erasmus is really the embodiment of educational diplomacy. And we also have culture, cultural competence that sits alongside sport in Article 165. And the EU has now develop some expertise in the field of cultural diplomacy. So this is not an entirely new thing for the European Union. I'm going to turn to, I think it's Thomas next. Uh, we've got, a, we've got a, a schedule on the, on the slides um, because Thomas was part, and Raffaella were part of this project in terms of leading pilot projects. And so I think we've got a video lined up for Thomas. Um, I don't know if, that's, uh, if, if that can be executed, if that's the right word. Do we have that? Where's the, uh, the clicker? Is Pauline there? The video? Okay, it's coming. Super glade for samarbejdet med, med verdensholdet. Det betyder rigtig meget for os ude på ambassaderne. Arbejder vi jo meget aktivt med at fortælle historien om Danmark, dansk kultur og danske værdier. Øhm, og derfor så er det jo simpelthen en gave for besøg af verdensholdet, fordi I kommer jo, I fortæller øh, virkelig historien om Danmark på en meget, meget fin måde. Så I er super gode ambassadører for Danmark, når I rejser rundt ude i verden. Jeg hedder Kasper, og jeg er ambassadør her i Indonesien. Tusind tak, fordi I gider at være lidt sammen med os i løbet af dag. Vi øh, synes, at det, I laver, det er noget, som vi er enormt stolte af. Øh, I kommer fra Danmark, I repræsenterer en moderne, sund livsstil. En af de ting, vi også kan gøre, det er at prøve at række ud til civilsamfundet. Og det er I med til at hjælpe os med, fordi når unge kommer og hjælper os med at række ud, 
øh, få aktiveret nogle af de unge her og børn her i øh, Estland, så, så når man bare ud med sit øh, budskab øh, om, øh, om Danmarks værdier på en helt anden måde, end øh, når ambassaden bare selv går ud i jakkesæt og så videre. Jeg synes, det er dejligt. Jeg bliver sådan helt rørt, når jeg ser øh, alle jeres gymnaster, øh, hvor søde de er ved børnene og hvor, hvor gode de er til at få dem i gang. Okay, so Thomas, we, uh, I mean, we've heard a lot today about what many of us might understand as sport diplomacy, the, that kind of the, the big state-to-state -state initiatives, the use of mega events. That looked very different. And, and it, if, if the subtitles didn't use the word diplomacy and ambassador, we might not even consider that di sport diplomacy. So what have we just witnessed? Yeah. You would say this is more or less the inside out of what we heard in the first panel discussion, uh, very much focused on sort of the governmental level or the national branding policies, you would say, in my eyes. And what we are doing is actually we're trying to turn that around and, and leave an impact. And to me, sports diplomacy is a multi-sided road or platform for many actors. Or you can say that there need to be some kind of, of duality uh, because you, the one thing that we heard about in the first panel discussion is nothing without, without the other, in, in my eyes. And uh, what we have been doing with the National Danish Performance Team, which is a unit under uh, the Danish Sport for All Association, uh, has been around for more than 30 years and, and living out of a mission of moving the world, that's also the payoff. But we actually living the policy, we are living the mission because we are nothing without leaving an impact or being or having a successful outreach. And when I say there's somehow a, a duality in, in the overall sort of the high level policy making that we have been hearing about at the first panel discussion, and it was more or less sort of the topic of today as well, is that we don't succeed only by having mega events because that the one-sided approach, that's the national, that's the, the, the governmental approach. Um, so what the, the Danish team is doing is that beyond or apart from being considered the world's most renowned performance gymnastic teams and very high level athletes, we do engage ourselves in local communities around the world. And, and this team actually every other year travels the world for 10 months and going to local communities, working from refugee camps in Uganda to high schools in, in, in Utah and everything in between. Um, and we sort of have a mutual dependency with uh, sort of the, the Danish representations abroad and the, the, the Danish Ministry of Foreign Affairs, for instance, and the Ministry of Culture and the Ministry of Health. All of those governmental entities are actually supporting what we're doing because they can see uh, it's a very powerful way of working with soft diplomacy or public diplomacy. And, and, and public diplomacy is a, is a, a thing that's been on the agenda for many years through the, the Danish um, ministries, and especially through the, the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. As, as, uh, we also, also heard that you know, it's, it's f a focus area uh, in, in sort of uh, branding of, of nations. But it came to me and many years ago, it'd been a practice around and we have never called it sports diplomacy, but I would consider myself maybe not by title, but at least an informal sports diplomat because I've been doing this for this many years. And uh, I'm taking sort of the, the overall national agenda on public diplomacy and making it operational. I'm, the team is instrumental to bring Danish values, the focus on Denmark and what the free ambassadors just stated here. Uh, they will never be able to sit at a dining table in Utah or work with kids in the refugee camps, but we do. And we sort of embodies everything that they have striving for years to you know, sort of cross the bar to 
to promote Denmark, and they have various initiatives. And they, there are certain expectations from the ministries at home to the Danish uh, uh, embassies around that they should work in this area, but they don't know how to. They don't have the means, financial or uh, resource-wise, otherwise. But and they don't have uh, they don't have the ideas. They don't have the toolbox to do this. So very often, when they think about public diplomacy, they call on the Royal Ballet or a cycling project, but you know, you don't have that outreach, you don't have that, the reach and numbers. Uh, so the pilot that we actually gauge on was to be more focused on the evidence and have the statement for and uh, case examples to our continued work in this area, having embassies work with us. Uh, so we could have case examples to spread within uh, the diplomatic core, how they can exploit or have that mutual dependency, because I have a very strong agenda when I knock on doors on Danish embassies around. Uh, and that's, of course, my mission to have a lot of kids and youth to exercise and have another perspective on equal access to sport and sports for and sports for life. That's, that's, that's why we have that uh, national team. It's not a competitive thing. Is an engaging thing. And uh, I would do a very bad job if it didn't leave an impact. And if it didn't get more kids and youth to exercise or have another perspective on equality through sports. Uh, so that's what, why I say you would not succeed with sports diplomacy without having that mutual dependency between the high level policymakers and the grassroots operators that I consider myself. But I actually in uh, I'm a bridge builder between those two things. So when I say I have a very strong agenda when I knock on doors uh, to the diplomatic representations or the ministry in Copenhagen is that is for my cause as well because they can support that. And I'm not I'm nothing uh, in sort of a, a country far out in Asia without having the support from a Danish diplomat knocking on doors and bringing me in on a high level um, decision makers being sort of the city mayor or even the minister of, of uh, health or minister of culture in, in a certain country that we operate with. And that opens doors to me, but I'm also very aware that I'm actually bringing in instruments for uh, the embassies and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, how to work on that high level policy making and how to actually promote, make that national branding of Denmark that they're so eager to do, but they have no instrument to do that. So that's why I say the policy, um, the, the sports dip diplomacy to me is that mutual dependency. And I'm very much aware on how to navigate in that. I've never called it sports diplomacy. It's just a way of practice. It's a way of operating. And we've been doing this for like 30 years. So it's quite interesting to have that, to me, that policy making aspect as well uh, alongside being or having that very hands-on approach uh, doing this because I, I could not succeed with what I'm doing if I'm not related, if I don't have that network or those relations into um, the policy circles as well. Okay, thank you. I'm going to come back to you in, in a moment, Thomas. I'm, I'd like to bring in uh, Rafaela here as well as um, because you also um, run a pilot project and you have vast experience uh, in other regards regarding grassroots sport diplomacy. So maybe you can just tell us a little bit about your pilot project and more generally what you do. <clears throat> Thanks. Yeah, so first of all, I'm uncomfortable as I don't, I am not English speaking and I'm not French speaking. So I am, I will, I will do my best, <laughs> but uh, otherwise I, I could speak in Russian, but I don't think the translator is all Italian, but okay, no, no problem. Um, yeah. And uh, I also feel uncomfortable as I am at the presence of so high level personalities working in so many years in, um, in sport diplomacy and promotion and advocacy maybe. And uh, so I'm just a little <laughs> um, person working in since many years also in um, peace processes and peace negotiations. Uh, 
there, there is in the background some images just from the activities we developed with the pilot action. Uh, yeah, I would like just to 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 try to focus on something that is maybe more important than just describe the pilot action as as it was realized. Um, it's uh, what we mean when uh, um, we talk about grassroots sport diplomacy in particular, because finally the question is that um, we believe there is a specific uh, power, a specific um, capacity and maybe ability, I don't know, um, that grassroots sport uh, is able to, to develop because we sometime also see, and maybe in these days uh, during the World Cup was quite clear, um, is still going on, sorry, is quite clear, how even sport environment, sport uh, containers and spaces can be somehow, somehow uh, affected by its censorship, let's say, or or limits in expression of also in the of some acts that are promoting human rights, and this is something that is a, a little bit a contradiction if we talk about diplomacy and the power of diplomacy in sport. Uh, I was thinking when just Thierry was mentioning Nelson Mandela, that, that of course is in our mind always when we we speak about what is the specific um, power of. Um, diplomatic and uh, not only diplomatic power of sport. I, I have in mind, the, the, of course, not the rugby uh, World Cup in South Africa that uh, everybody knows. And there is, um, I, I think there is really a crash, <laughs> a clash, a crash between, between this example and the example of the World Cup going on in Qatar. I I really think that this is maybe the the, the reason why grassroots sport is playing uh, some some specific power that can be more useful in uh, crossing also barriers that are sometimes are coming also from federations and institutions to the sport institutions, not only the institutions of uh, the other of other kind. So. This is something that we tested, of course, not just in the pilot test that we had uh, in Rome during uh, this uh, project, um, but uh, in many occasions and many spaces and many very, very heavily affected by conflicts uh, um, contexts like uh, Lebanon in a refugee camp, Palestinian refugee camp in, in Lebanon or in, in Senegal, a specific context that was uh, affected by many conflicts at local level, or of course, Israel and uh, Palestinian territories and many other examples. I, I, I have no time to, to describe all of this, but of course, all these experiences are in our background when we try to develop the uh, the experience during the pilot test in Rome. I don't know if I can just how to to do this. Yeah. No. Ah, sorry. Yeah. Oh my God. Okay. In any case, um, so what was the, our experience was. Um, <laughs> no problem. That is not important. I, I I think it's more important just to 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 explain. Uh, the the pilot test was aiming to um, use the power, the specific power of the grassroots sport um, diplomacy in a in a district of Rome. It's a Pietralata district. Yeah, it's okay. Something is going on. Um, and it's an area where um, we we have a lot of um, criticalities on on the ground, and uh, we try to not just use sport, grassroots sport, to include the people that is marginalized, 
for different reasons, uh, who is migrant, who is a refugee, who is uh, blind, who is uh, um, in prison, who is in, in um, with uh, some mental uh, problem. And um, so including the different uh, uh, social uh, actors that are on the ground in this district in, in the activity that we developed uh, through the pilot test, but trying to um, promote and create a dynamic between all these different actors so and the local of course uh, population of the district this is what we have been um, trying to do and uh, so trying to create a space that is a specific space that the grassroots sport is able to 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 create uh, because finally um, uh, so all of us we organize events very nice events and uh, activities and uh, this one that was uh, just described is uh, absolutely fantastic uh, but of course we um, we also try to understand how we can uh, um, be more proactive in promoting and facilitating um, cross-sector relationships cross-sector um mutual understanding because uh the different actors that were involved in the pilot action uh were very different and uh, some of them have in mind always the very stereotype idea of sport which is the you know just the, to become a champion to become a, of course a man and of course uh football this is the automatic uh, <laughs> Uh, result of or, of the idea when uh, when you approach um, a local service or social mental health and center or prison etc cetera, etc cetera. you you need to to always ex um, broke the barriers that we have in mind and especially this kind of uh, actors have in mind when when you come and you try to propose to to be involved in an activity or in an event so you have to <laughs> destroy these barriers and these uh, stereotypes that are in mind by the institutions, the local uh, institutions that were involved. And you can see just uh, some examples of the in this um, in the picture that you have. Uh, we, we involved, of course, the local municipality uh, from Pietralata because Rome is composed by 15 local municipalities and this was the municipality we involved and, of course, the mental health center and uh, the Rebibia prison that is uh, also based in the district and uh, mm, the uh, a specific center that is uh, working with uh, uh children and not and adults also uh, blind blind uh, adults and the children and uh as as well we involved one federation which is <laughs> the institutional one uh it's the rugby federation which is uh, quite um, quite um, sensible and um open to to this kind of activities and is also promoting um a lot of uh, grasso sport activities so involving all these actors all these subjects and uh, all the the local <clears throat> i don't know why i hear my voice um different stakeholders at local level as well because we we cannot think that we are uh self uh, representative. I don't know if it's really exactly the same meaning of the Italian word, but uh, we don't think that we are um, self-sufficient as a sport uh, uh, association. We think that we need the capacity and the, the what happens. It works. Okay. It's better that I'm in that direction. Okay. Yeah. Uh, an example of what I'm saying is exactly in my uh, in the slide, it's uh, an association that is called the uh, uh, trainer runner trainer, and uh, is um, is doing the work with the blind uh, people, and uh, also um, at the same time was trying to to involve participants that were not blind in the uh, practicing the sport in in the situation in the condition of a blind person. So it was a way also to to um, 
an example of the possibility to, to create a dynamic, which is not just uh, to include and make people participate, but also to, um, to facilitate the understanding of the condition of the others uh, through uh, proving what, what it means. And uh, this is just a, a really a small example, it's not a, a big one, but it's uh, for sure an example that was uh, quite, um, it was like, uh, for some children it was uh, like a joke, but then it was, um, they put a lot of questions after this. And this is uh, something that is uh, maybe the result of the of this um, attempt to, to explain what it means to, to be marginalized and how you need to include uh, people that is in this condition. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, this is the, the rest of the examples of the blinding baseball. It was uh, yeah, and uh, sitting volley and uh, and other other activities. Um, so th let's say that the 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 activity was developed. The, the pilot was uh, realized through different activities. Some of them are in the pictures, and um, are sport typical sport activities and sport for all for activities. But uh, then we had also. Um, a round table uh, where also Saska Benedicic Tomat that is here was with us. Uh, so also representing in general the the project uh, as such in uh, in the event. It was maybe 30 and more. <laughs> I don't know how much it was very hot, but uh, we resist. And we discussed, and there were the different stakeholders that we involved in the pilot test um, were there. So they were representing the blinding center, the uh, the association, and specifically the representative for the rights of prisoners, and um, and uh, as also municipality of Rome, uh, the delegate for sport, and um, the federation, uh, rugby federation, and uh, Liberinantes, the association that is uh, has a team of refugees, uh, also in the same district, and uh, and others. So it was uh, a moment when we we discussed on uh, and tried to explain <laughs> uh, to broke this uh, stereotype of the sport as a tool of inclusion that is uh, like a formula, but finally. Many times people just think that uh, to be included means to to become a champion in in a in a way or in another, and this was a probably uh, at least this is what I think. I don't know if uh, Saska will uh, will add some co considerations, but it was uh, quite an interesting debate because it was maybe the first time, especially at district level, that we developed the discussion and um, trying to to facilitate the, the knowledge of uh, the different capacities and abilities uh, by the different stakeholders and the institutions, which is uh, not very easy. And especially in this period in Italy is not easy at all. So, um, and then we, we had, of course, a lot of um, uh, other activities. And one of them was, uh, uh, not not one, but a few of them <laughs> are in these pictures. And uh, one was uh, an exhibition um, on the sport and uh, racism and uh, how sport can be um, a form, a way to fight racism. And there were examples of uh, how racism in sport was um, mm, has been and unfortunately is still uh, today uh, in sport and um, in Italy. In particular, and uh, and at, at the same time, of course, we we mentioned a lot of other examples uh, taken from history uh, about uh, racism in sport. And this exhibition was um, uh, still going on. Actually, it's uh, going to, through the district in different places, in schools and and the centers that we mentioned before. 
and um, and there were a few meetings with uh, uh, the children of the district that are part of the summer uh, were part of the summer camp organized by WISP every year in the district and uh, it was really <laughs> amazing meetings because they uh, there were, of course, a different kind of children. Children are from many nationalities and um, many realities of the district. And uh, it was an occasion to to interact with them. And maybe sometime is much better than with the adults because they are quite open and uh, mind and able to to interact and uh, put questions without any. Mm, stereotypes maybe in their mind at least uh, when they are still uh, children uh, part of the um, action was also the, the dissemination of the the meaning we were talking about uh, during the events and uh, activities and uh, mm, one radio was in particular very interesting and it is a, a radio that is uh, called the radio that radio that um, hear you because it's a it's a radio created by the blind um, people of the center that we mentioned uh, I mentioned before and uh, they created this radio and they are working quite a lot with this um, tool and um, promoting uh, of course the meaning of the grass sport uh, diplomacy it was uh, shared and uh, quite participated at least uh, by the specific uh, target group and um, the same of course was done with uh, other local uh, uh, media and um, and uh, local radio and tv and uh, newspapers and there is other images there just uh, showing that there was also rugby <laughs> and um, one of the associations is uh, called uh, Implacabili, uh, which is a very nice group and they were doing a lot of uh, work trying to involve also uh, not not just the children but also uh, adults in the activities and uh, just to show how it was hot that day people try to survive under the shadow of the of a table um and then that's it i mean i think it's i was already too long so i stop here because the football is football and you have know about it enough but just the last image just to to explain this is the ball uh, for baseball that is a specific ball for blind people it uh, has a sonar power so people were uh, playing with this and uh, it was uh, an extraordinary occasion especially with this uh, old man that you see is teaching the the child and he's um, a very <laughs> grandfather let's say of of the district and uh, he's playing uh, teaching uh, baseball to children blind children and uh, also children that is not blind but was blinded artificially to to understand what it means to to have different uh, capacities and abilities that's it thank you Raffaella um, I'm aware that we are over time um, it, in my defense we we did start the panel um, somewhat late I uh, apologize to the uh, interpreters. Um, I, I, I don't know if we're still having interpretation, but if we are, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to ask the audience um, if they have any questions, because I'm aware that I haven't given you the opportunity yet. So please feel free to raise a hand. We, we do. I don't see one. We do have a representative of a, another pilot project here with uh, with um judith i don't know if you'd like to make any uh any, a contribution or uh, say what your project was about and uh, and, and your work or there's a if you do there's a microphone so welcome everyone uh i represent the Sports University of Budapest, Hungary, and I'm really, really honored to be part of this gathering as well as the whole project, which was a major success. And we were really happy to participate. 
and involves so many people. Um, for our contribution, just on a short note, I think this was the single project which focused on higher education and how to uh, enable people from all walks of life, especially from sports as second career athletes, as well as people from diplomacy, acting diplomats who have no idea about sports. And people like me, myself, or Anna, who's also, she's there, she's an acting diplomat though. So a number of people enter sports diplomacy without actually uh, any knowledge of what it is about. They do it. And learning by doing is their way to get involved. And so our project was about, um, first of all, raising consciousness and awareness about um, skills that a sports diplomat might need in any specific area, including grassroots. And uh, of course, also we elaborated um, you know, several ways how to test, how to interview acting diplomats about their experiences, about the set of skills required, the core set and the extended set that might be useful. I'm sure, for instance, Thomas knows that learning by doing and, and doing this major adventure that you guys are doing, it's amazing, congratulations. So I believe that the second and the third trip, you knew what you were doing better than the first trip because you didn't learn it, I guess. So many people simply do it and find themselves working for sports federations and not having any kind of a formal education. And so we don't really advocate for formal education, although we have developed as a re result of this project, uh, a one year international program in sports diplomacy and also a one course like a BIP program under Erasmus for the same matter. But we, what we want to advocate for is that people need help and support from you guys, basically, who are acting and experienced in this arena to, to get this knowledge that exists in this room today that they don't have, you know. So we, uh, I'm sure that you all know people who are former Olympic champions and they are hired for sports federation jobs. Why on earth would we expect them to know how to act in diplomacy? They do it and hopefully they do it well. And sometimes they say, you know, soft diplomacy came to them as natural. But for others, for instance, I know a guy who works for Philippines, a Hungarian mission there, you know, he has got no formal knowledge of sports, especially not grassroots or any, any particular sport area. And so for him to have a, uh, an education or have an access to this knowledge in a hybrid format um, training, that's valuable. So we had, for instance, Hedvig Karakash, who is an Olympic champion, uh, participating and actually writing her thesis on soft diplomacy and soft skills. And we also have a number of other students interested who are really, really excited to enter another project like this or in any kind of a project where they can learn skills and develop their skills. So I hope that this program that we did in Budapest means a meaningful contribution to these wonderful, wonderful projects that you guys have been doing in grassroots and uh, respect for all of you and your devoted work. And also um, gratitude goes to Iska and all our wonderful collaborative partners, especially Saska and Mogens, uh, who were in the in Budapest as well. And, and it was a tremendously important presence for us at the university to present sports diplomacy as something to be studied at a higher education level. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Judith. Judith. Um, I suspect it's probably time for me to wrap up, in, unless there's anything that the panel wish to get off their chest. Um, I don't have Simon's skills of summarizing the previous uh, uh, discussion. Um, what I would say is, um, in terms of the European Union's role, the European Union's role is not to harmonize, it's not to have a, a common approach in terms of sport diplomacy necessarily. In fact, the European Union has no powers to do that. It's, it's prohibited under the fourth paragraph of Article 165 of the treaty. But what the European Union can do is it can support, it can uh, coordinate, it can facilitate some of these wonderful actions that we've been hearing today. 
So uh, with that, thank you very much. Thank you to the to Iris, the organizers. Thank you to Desti and the project. And um, we're happy to take questions maybe over a more social setting. So thank you. It will be very short, I promise you, because I'm standing in between you and the drinks. So it will be very short, but uh, I promise to give a short uh, closing remark. It's not a conclusion, it's closing remark, and uh, I will be very brief. Thank you. Uh, what I think is uh, one remark is that uh, we have enough to act. It was mentioned earlier that the European Union provided us with two reports, one on spot diplomacy and another one on Brussels spot diplomacy. And that it in itself tells a lot about sport in the European Union. First, you make a sport diplomacy report, and then you consider you also need one for grassroots sport uh, diplomacy. But it's good to have a grassroots sport diplomacy report together with a sport diplomacy report, but it also indicates the European Union and the European Commission's different perspective on sport. Some of the institutions have an elite perspective. The Parliament, European Parliament, has a more grassroots oriented perspective, and the Erasmus Plus program is primarily for grassroots. So I think these two reports also indicate very well the uh, European uh, Union position at that time. Several researchers are here and many have uh, contributed to research on sport diplomacy and grassroots sport diplomacy over the last 15 years. And uh, then comes the TSD project. And I would call the TSD project, not only because we are partner in it, a very user-friendly project, very politician-friendly project where you on short, reports on a website, get very short but comprehensive knowledge on what is sport diplomacy. Meaning that we have also, I think for the first time, indications from 27 countries what they are doing on sport diplomacy in Sweden, Spain, Italy, Germany, France, and so on. So very short, but very comprehensive. The five pilots, they are not just five pilots. These pilots are illustrating the many thousand events that are taking place in sport diplomacy across the world. Two of them are international, two of them are national, local, and one is, as mentioned by Judith, an educational project. So they have a variety and that should illustrate exactly uh, that there is a very broad uh, width of activities in sport diplomacy. Should we act more? You are up to decide for yourself if you want to act more. But I would say any sports sector actor should react to major agendas. Sometimes the sports sector itself is too exclusive, introvert, and focusing on own thing. 20 years ago, health agenda was on many public agendas and many sport associations didn't see it, they missed it. Now it's more integrated and there are more sport organizations that has uh, contributed to the public health agenda. What about a social balance? What about the coming agendas on sustainability? So also here consider the sport diplomacy part, maybe it's so big an agenda or diplomacy part in general is maybe so big an agenda that you as an organization should go into it. Richard very precisely said that the European Union are not to tell us what to think and do, uh, not a common uh, thing. But we have something in common. Uh, European constitution, if I'm not mistaken, Article 2 says that it's made to build 
a European Union that promotes peace and well-being for its citizens. We have also some common rules. We have human rights, we have a rule of law, and we have democracy as some, some common basis for what we are doing. We also have the right to create associations, civil society, and that means non-governmental organizations. And, and that is very relevant for, for the sports sector. Also because we, in many countries, have a variety of volunteer engagement, but the civil society part and the volunteer engagement is a picture that is in different degree illustrating sport in the European Union. So what is the common sport diplomacy? Is it a pluralistic diversity where we have uh, different values and habits? And on the other side is the uh, centralized uh, common political positions. And that is possible. And we saw that when Russia entered Ukraine, some of the ministries made a common position on that. Normally that is slow. In this occasion, it was very fast. comes up a little different on the screen. I would like to try to look around in the, the corner uh, and look into the future and what is coming. Uh, we speak about a lot of soft diplomacy and sometimes we also say soft diplomacy is silence diplomacy. Thinking of the World Cup in football in Qatar, I also think we can say that soft sport diplomacy not necessarily is silent. It's quite loud. And I think the future it will be uh, loud diplomacy, soft but loud diplomacy. So a good advice for me would be, you have to know your own storytelling, you own that, but you should also be aware of that you don't own the communication. So you can plan your story about the Olympic games 2024 in Paris, but there will be people challenging something of what you do. You own your own story, but be aware of that there are also some who will challenge that, as we see right now in Qatar and FIFA. So one suggestion would be, if you have not done yet, better consider your values and actions, what is important for you. And to reference uh, Lawrence Fisher, find the structure that's needed for you. She mentioned that France start to structure sport diplomacy in 2013. And the different countries, different entities have to find the structure that's needed, whether that's public ambassadors or it's citizen driven uh, initiatives as we heard in the pilots, or it's as I would say in the Qatar and Saudi version, purely money. You can buy sport diplomacy if you have enough. So I wouldn't tell you what to do just to consider that there are many ways, but knowing your values and your actions, knowing that you are not the only one telling the story, I think that will be what we see in the future. We will not see only soft silence diplomacy, we will see soft, loud diplomacy. <laughs> Finally, I would like to say thank you to Iris, the motor in the project. Thank you to all in Iris who have been contributing. It was a pleasure for us to participate. Thank you to the other partners. And also thank you very much to the five pilots who represent many more pilots than only five. And also for the rest of you who contributed. So thank you very much. Sorry for the for the problem. Um, yeah, th the idea was just to say um, thank you all uh, for for this one, and just to invite you to have a drink. Uh, we, I, I don't. I'm not sure it it was a uh, uh, useful to to say that uh, again. But anyway, um, you can join us uh, at the um, in the conference room um, on the on the other uh, on the other side of the of the other building. Thank you once again very much. I would also to thank you um, the translator uh, which made a, a great job um, and thank you everyone
uh, Salim, the communication team, of course, uh, the, the Irish team uh, in English, um, in complete, and um, of course, uh, the wonderful panel. Thank you very much, and uh, see you in a few. And thank you to Carole.